King Kamehameha III had resigned under protest, and the islands had been returned. She decided to do the same thing. And so the annexationists won without a physical fight. Their representatives took the Queen's signed resignation, along with a hurriedly drawn-up request for annexation, and sailed for Washington on the first boat out. The Queen was not allowed to send anyone to represent her until the next ship left, giving the annexationists a good head start. Meanwhile, John Stevens and the American Marines had overseen a peaceful takeover by the provisional government, soon to be known as the PGs. Even within this group, there were mixed feelings about what had happened. Sanford Dole, the well-respected American, had indeed become the acting president of Hawaii. To his brother George in California, Dole wrote, How I have regretted this whole affair. Had I my way about the matter, I would have used far more tactful ways than the treatment we have thus rendered. I have reiterated time and again my desire that we hold the power of the throne in a trust, in the name of the young princess Kaiulani, until she reaches her majority. He was hoping this could still come about. The annexationists may have won the first round, but neither the queen nor her loyal niece was willing to give up without a fight. Kaiulani was devastated by the news. She got a letter from her father, in which he blamed Lili Uokalani for all our troubles. He had been called in to advise her, but she hadn't listened. As he explained, If the queen had abdicated the night of the 16th or early on the 17th, the throne, I think, could have been saved. But she did not think they would do as they did. I visited her several times that day, the 17th, and told her there would be a provisional government. Still she held on, and one hour after, the committee called and told her they had the government in their hands. While others saw making Kaiulani queen as a solution to the violent hatred some Howley had for Lili Iokalani, the princess herself wanted only to see her aunt reinstated. Her guardian, Theo Davies, who had once been British consul to Hawaii, knew the fight was not yet lost, but that the battle had moved from Honolulu to Washington, D.C., he felt that if they had any hope of saving the country, they had to move quickly. Look, roared Davies about the newspapers now coming from America. They're saying Hawaiians are uneducated savages and capable of governing themselves. His gaze fell on his young ward. I know of the answer that will end that argument forever. You. Kaiulani had felt gravely wounded by the coup in Hawaii. Even if what Mr. Davies said was true, how would she ever find the courage to stand up against all these determined men? She was only a teenager. But then she thought of her sisters, Annie, Helen, and Rosie, and their children. She thought of Koa and Kuyo, and all of her Hawaiian friends. She remembered the proud heritage of her people. She knew that it was the responsibility of the Ali'i to protect and stand up for his or her people. While she might lack the courage to demand rights for herself, when she thought of the Hawaiian people, her people, she felt strong. So when Theo Davies said he felt they had to travel to the United States to help fight the overthrow, Kaiulani replied, Perhaps someday the Hawaiians will say, Kaiulani could have saved us, but she didn't even try. I will go with you. The new wardrobe that had been so carefully readied for touring Europe suddenly had a new purpose. To dress an educated, distinguished princess who was, in a sense, going to war. The 17-year-old, who so recently had had the luxury of giggling about trying to properly enter a drawing room, was suddenly being asked to walk onto the stage of history.